Good morning, everyone. So exciting to be here. Every, um, thank you, everyone, for coming so early. Uh, thank you, Chi. Um, I have so many questions. And um, the first one would be, let's go, let's do a little time traveling. So on December 1st, 2022nd, we all woke up to a new world propelled by gener generative AI. And it was all instigated by OpenAI's launch of ChatGPT. So you, as a legal advisor, has to be always a few steps ahead. Did you anticipate what has happened? How did your professional life change since then? It's changed a bit. So, uh, so first of all, thank you, everyone, for also for taking the time. And when, when Daniel first told me the session would be at 8.30, I said, Daniel, no one wants to get up at 8.30 on Vegas. On the second day of a conference, I don't even want to, like, want to get up at 8:30. And but he said, you know, it'd be pretty popular. And thank you guys for taking the time to, to come here. So so yeah, so ChatGPT has been it's been a, a kind of a life changing experience for a lot of people. And I think, you know, at the time we were hoping that you know optimistic that it would do well, but not you know not certain. You're never certain. And but what you know what we we put out we put it out there and we were really, you know really surprised and uh, amazed by the reception that we got. It is. For those who have been in this field for a while, it is based on technology that has been around for a number of years, and even you know ver prior versions of it that weren't this kind of conversational interface were already available. You could use you could do the same thing on the OpenAI website for a very long time, and so that part did surprise us a little bit. And basically, something about the having that technology in a way that was easily accessible and understandable to people, I think, really really resonated across the world. And so we were very we we're very fortunate and very happy about that. Um, so a few readers of Turing Post asked me your relationship with ChatGPT. Do you use it on a daily, day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so, so we use it a lot internally. I remember when GPT-4, which is the more powerful model that, that powers ChatGPT, when, when we were testing it internally, it, it, it makes, I mean, there, there's sometimes it, it is not factually accurate 100% of the time. And so I remember looking at it and going, Who is ever, no one will ever use this for legal purposes because that's crazy, right? You can't. Your, your lawyer can't be wrong two out of eight, two out of 10 times. And so, but there are surprisingly some, some, you know, a lot of companies and a lot of partners of ours who have tapped into that and figured out a way to make it useful, you know, in terms of context and having, you know, having the right databases to access and so on. But so, so we use it internally for a lot of different reasons. So one very popular uh, internal OpenAI use case has been to, um, to uh, use it to summarize meetings. And so we were using it, to, having, you know, meetings recorded and a transcript created, and then it would summarize and tell you who was there and, and you know, what, what the action items are and who the attendees were and, and what the follow-ups were. And then I personally and my, team, my legal team, we use it a lot for, to give it you know, parts, you know, some, some things that we want to publish or talk about publicly and say, make this easier to understand, write this in more plain English, write this in a non-legalese way. And that's been, it's very useful, it's very good that way, and it's been very popular. Did you get any good legal advice from it? I have not gotten any great legal advice from, from ChatGPT, but one day maybe. <laughs> um, so we are in this uh, in the midst of unpre unpredictability. Um, how do you navigate such an uncertain regulatory landscape, and um, how does this influence your research and um, development process? Yeah. So, so I've been fortunate enough to be in this field for a few years now. And I think one thing that has really struck me just across the board is that no one is really sure what the right answer is, right? And, but, and honestly, anyone who tells you they know for sure what the regulatory landscape should look like and what the right way to do it is probably not, is probably not right. Um, and so everyone is trying to kind of figure it out. All the governments in the world are trying to figure it out. The industry is trying to figure it out. Academia is trying to figure it out. And so I think what you really do in those cases is you think about, like, what is, the, what is past precedent? What have people done in similar situations? Innovative technology, have, not having a clear regulatory landscape, is not a new thing at all, right? That happens every several years, right? It happened with the internet, it happened with mobile, it happened with a lot of different things. And I think you know this current generation of AI technology is very similar, which is there are a lot of things that are new about it, but fundamentally there are a lot of things that you can analogize it to and compare it to, and we can talk a little bit more about the substantive way, way to think about that. But and so it's really just well, you you know you think about. Based on what's happened historically, what is the best? You know, how should you approach this in the future? It's kind of like AI prediction, right? It's, you know, you, you analyze historical data and you, you try to make predictions on future outcomes, and then and then you do it in a good faith way that you know is based on the correct principles that the laws and regulations are generally trying to cover. And then you work with a lot of different constituents and stakeholders and, and you know, policymakers and so on to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how often do you like, recalibrate your plan? Uh, probably on a weekly basis. <laughs> well, I, I joke that you know one week at OpenAI since ChatGPT launches, you know about three months in the real world, and so things things move very quickly. Certainly. Um, so yeah, OpenAI puts a lot of effort into building uh, connections with different governments. Um, and um, can you share this unique experience with us? You've been traveling a lot recently. Yeah. So I, I think you know it, it is kind of what I said earlier, which is. Everyone is really excited and not really sure the best thing to do, and that goes for every government agency that we've talked to. And th this is true in my time at Amazon as well. You know, we'd meet it with a lot of policymakers on AI, and the first thing they would say is, what are you, what are you talking about? Why, why does this matter to my day-to-day? -day? Why does this matter to my constituents and so on? And I think now people under, understand why it should matter, but they're not really, they don't really understand what they should do and how, or how they should think about it or how they should regulate it or deal with it. And so, and, but I, I think the common thing that we do see is that all these policymakers and regulators are still very uh, genuinely trying to understand it, so they can do the right thing. And and this is just one of the again same, one of the latest things of you know disruptive technologies that they have to go deal with and think about. And sometimes they don't like doing it that much. And but but they are, I think they are, there's general recognition that hey this is important. This is here to stay. This is something that is really, that is really has changed and will continue to change the world. And we shouldn't not have it. We should figure out how to use it, you know, kind of handle it and build it and, and develop it and release it uh, carefully and thoughtfully. Why don't, what, what don't they yet understand about it? I think we, so, yeah, it's a good question. I, I would say a few years ago, just even the what and the how was just complete mystery. And now I would say the what is, there's some amorphous understanding of what the what is, but there's not really a clear understanding of the how. Um, and so they're, they're, trying, they're still trying to figure out that fundamentally, you know, what, what is it, what, like, what, what are these words coming out, how do they get created, how do I know when they're wrong, like, wh how, like wh why are they wrong, right? And because there's a lot, the, the current, the old paradigm of thinking is like an internet, you got a database, you got data, you, you go get data from there. And what, you know, generative models are doing is very, something very different, right? They're creating, they're writing stuff fresh, or they're creating new things from scratch based on past learnings. And so that mental model, I think, is, is hard to understand. I mean, it's hard for me to, you know, fully understand, too. But like that fundamental question is something that they're still trying to wrap their hands around. And I think once they understand that clearly, it'll be a lot, make a lot more sense in terms of where you should regulate it, where you should be more, more careful. So it's a longer educational process for them? I, I mean, I think it's gonna be a very quick educational process for them, but, but it's, it is, I think that is what the core part of what, what is happening. There's a lot of educational stuff right now just to understand how it works, you know, risks, harms, and all that. I think people hear a lot about the risks and the harms, and then they also see, a lot of people see personally the good use cases, but, but everything in between is, is still a little bit murky. Um, what are the particular uh, challenges <clears throat> in working across different jurisdictions? Oh, man, yeah. Uh, there's a lot. I, I think I would say, as, as many of you know, different countries and different regions are, are having slightly different takes on how to regulate AI, right? Some of them want to approach it as one big thing. I think there are gonna be a lot of challenges with that. AI is a, if you're sitting here, you know this, but AI is a very broad term. It's not really a regulatory term. It means anything you want it to mean. It means any behavior that a, that a machine can do, that a person can do. And so I think it's gonna be very challenging to say, you should regulate AI machine behavior with one law, right? We don't have one law that regulates human behavior. We have lots and lots of laws. And so, so I think that's the thing that you know, some regions will have to think about. You know, others are approaching it in a more, uh, more kind of sector-specific way, think about the different industries and how AI could be used there and you know, how to regulate those in, the use cases in those industries specifically. And others are just you know, somewhere in the middle or somewhere on, on other extremes. But the most common thing, theme is that everyone does want to Every government does want to understand how to how to regulate this properly, and so you know I think one not not great outcome would be that every single country in the world has a slightly different legal framework that you have to think about when you're when you're using you know AI technologies there. And so you know we're we're very hopeful and you know part of the global conversation on how do you make this a you know, how do you make this a more understandable you know global standard overall. And that's hard, right? You know international coordination on anything is going to be very challenging, and especially on new technologies. It is very challenging. So how does your team navigate it? Like in more detail, Celeste. Yeah, so I mean, it's so again, a lot of it right now is in the education phase. So we do, do a lot of traveling to go talk to them, meet with them in person. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of the different governments are getting into it. Recently, the White House, you know, announced the, their their commitments from the major AI research labs. Uh, I think the UK is going to, you know, talk about their one of their major summits soon. 
and you know Japan and you know and other a lot of other countries are also you know stepping into it. Um, and so you know I mean we spend a lot of time you know we hire really good people we spend a lot of time reading and following up and thinking about the issues. To, to me though you know the way you think about a, a you know disruptive new technology like this is you always try to analogize you try to figure out what it's doing and then analogize from there right. And the way the way I usually break it down is. If, if you really just simplify the current, you know, most machine learning, but just the, definitely the current generation, it's, again, it's analyzing historical data to make a prediction on the future, right? And so you, if you understand those two things, you kind of understand 90% of what you need to think about from a regulatory perspective, because if, if there's issues with the historical data, right? There may be bias, it may be inaccurate, and so on. And so you have to think about use case scenarios where that might not be a good indicator to rely on. And then it's making a prediction on the future. It's not telling you what the right answer is. It's not guaranteeing an answer. It's making a prediction. And so there are scenarios where predictions are not the best thing that we're relying on. There, there are lots of scenarios where prediction is great and useful. There are some scenarios where a prediction is not going to be that useful, and, there's, and you, shouldn't, you shouldn't do it without a person you know, involved that's vetting it. And there are other scenarios where prediction is not what you want to do at all. You want a concrete, real, right answer. right? And so balancing those two, I think, is going to be the key for any any regulatory framework, and including all the use cases that you guys in here are thinking about. And if you can, can think about that, those and how they relate to your use case, I think you can predict a lot of the challenges that are gonna come with that and anticipate. And that, that's what we spend our time doing, to thinking about, look, when we released Dolly, our image model, for example, no one in the world knew how to think about that from a legal perspective. And the way I thought about it was, well, if we just hired 1,000 people to draw things really fast and, and give them back to people, how, how, would, how would we do that? And then you went with, based on that kind of framework, you start you know, building out a, a, better, a, a better governance, a better uh, uh, legal structure. Um, so what would be your ideal, um, what, what would be your ideal way for policymakers to work on the regulatory landscape? Yeah, I, I think it'd be similar to what I just said, you know, so you know, learn about what you're doing, think about the, the positive stuff that, that is happening. Think about the areas that, if you, again, if, if you think about historical data and predictions, like there, there are areas that that doesn't matter at all, right? So you should leave those areas alone. There are areas, highly regulated industries, for example, where that is actually very, going to be very dangerous and very challenging. And those are the areas that should take a lot of time and focus. And I think trying to paint it all with one brush is going to be hard. And you know, there's going to be, it'll be uh, interesting to see how all of that shakes out. But, but you know, I, I think they're approaching it generally the right way, which is they are quit, they're very curious, they're very inquisitive, they're very worried. Uh, I think you know, there's a lot, been a lot of rhetoric around AI and you know, both the good and the, and, the, and, the, and the harms. I think probably both are overstated a little bit. And the, the truth is, like anything, somewhere in the middle, which is, hey, this is really good stuff, and this is also potential to be you know, dangerous or, or, you know, or harmful, and then we should think about the best ways to, to balance that. But I think, again, I, I've, not encountered, I'm not, I've not had an encounter with any policymaker or any regulator where I walked away saying, look, they're, they're, they don't get it at all. Uh, you know, a lot of times the degree of education is different, but everyone is pretty smart about it, and they're pretty, you know, there's, it's, it's been in the news nonstop for the past year or so, and so everyone is kind of very, very eager to dive into the specific details and ask very good and nuanced questions. So and it's just, it's a hard topic, right? But I think they're all approaching it the right way. Thank you. Um, let's talk about how to implement in the enterprises. So um, enterprises want to use this cutting edge AI, uh, but sometimes it's hard to figure out how to and what they can and cannot do with these tools. Um, so what would be, what do you typically say to enterprise clients who are interested in um, leveraging your tools? Yeah, I, I think the most common introduction that we get from enterprise clients is they say, look, I read about AI all the time, and you know, it's, you can't you can't avoid it. We really need to do something. We're going to do something. What should we do? And and, and so and, and that's that's a question that probably you know resonates with some people in this room as well, which is you know it's a it's a very general technology, right? Like large language models are just, just they write stuff for you, and then how, if you had, and they understand stuff and they write stuff for you, right? And then how do you what is useful in your business? To, where is better understanding useful in your business? And the answer is literally everywhere. And, and then you have to think about, well, what is it, where is it actually, where is it actually implementable, where, where can we actually do stuff, and so on. And so usually from a risk and you know, regulatory conversation, when I, when I talk to other sites, lawyers and, you know, and, 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 and compliance teams and so on, it's, it's very similar to the conversation we're having here, which is, well, we should think of, you should think about, you know, understand what it is, its predictions and, you know, and all that. You also think about, it's, it's, again, so broad it can be used literally anywhere. And so you should think about well, like, what are the areas that you could try and test it out at that are relatively low risk, that you, know, that you can get a pretty, pretty good added lift without 
running through a bunch of potential uh, you know, ex liability, legal exposure. And start with those, start thinking about those, scope them out, learn this stuff, get, get your institutional knowledge, you know, get, get some institutional muscle built up to understand how to, how to deal with these things, how to, come, how to deal with the questions that come up, who, who should learn this stuff in the company. These are all really good questions that every company is gonna tackle slightly differently. So you start with the small, low risk use cases to test it out. Then you kind of start expanding to related ones or other areas. And before you know it, you become one of the leaders in, in the area and trying to, you know, and pioneering the, the future of AI in your industry. And that, that's happened with a lot of the partners that we've, we, we've worked with is, you know, before ChatGPT really blew up, they, they spent the time and the effort really digging in and understanding and, and going through the, the details and not just, not just high level saying, we're, new, we're doing AI, it's more like, where are the specific areas that AI is going to help us? How are we going to implement it? How are we going to clean up all that data that's there? How are we going to hook it up to all our different systems? And the people who spent that level of, intentionality to, to think about it are the ones who are really successful today. When they ask you about where liability falls uh, in terms of misuse of AI tools, yeah. what do you tell them? That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, I mean, it's a hard, it's a controversial topic. So the answer is no one really knows, right? If you, you know, you've got the developers of AI systems, you've got the, the or you've got the creators of AI systems like ourselves, you've got the developers and the, and the enterprises and the companies that are building things and you have the users and you know, downstream users. And so I think you know, much like self-driving cars, there's a lot of questions around who, who's responsible for what and where and when. And I think you know, these current tools, are, we have the same conversations, right? And you know, in, in some cases, you know, it's, it, you know, if, I'm, if a end user puts in something into a model that, create, that cre creates something that may cause liability, well, is that the end user? Is that the, is that the company that offered it to the end user? Is that us? And there's different, different people are gonna be, de you know, have different responsibilities and different you know, abilities to have oversight into that. And so, so those are all kind of the, the questions that we're discussing with, with clients and with, with you know, governments today. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned to go like step by step, but is, uh, is there any other risk management actions um, you can advise clients to make sure they use AI tools safely? Yeah, I mean, I think one, one of the big questions that comes up a lot is, you know, should you have a separate AI org or, you know, res you know a responsible AI or ethical AI organization? Should you have an AI officer? Um, you know, Everyone, everyone has to go figure that out for themselves. But I think definitely what you want is very strong knowledge management practices and the ability to both take in new information about the field and latest happenings and developments and also push it back out. I had a good, I had a good conversation with a, with a big customer of ours yesterday about like they're trying to build essentially a center of excellence within their company, a very large corporation, and, and how do you how do you get everyone else up to speed on it? And like, you, you don't want to grow your own internal internal AI org so large that it kind of dwarfs everything else and have, have that AI org have to go learn all the different aspects of the business, you might be better off building just a small specialized knowledge, you know, train, train the trainer type, type concept where these guys, these people learn it and then can go evangelize it out to the rest of the company because it's much easier for, it's easier to teach AI concepts and risks and liabilities than it is to go learn entirely new business lines across the board. So that, I think that that's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, do you restrict the use of OpenAI's tools <clears throat> in some scenarios or industries, or you think uh, the industry should figure it out themselves? Yeah, I mean, we definitely restrict it. We have a you know, long list of usage policies. Many of you are probably familiar with it. But we have a long list of usage policies or usage restrictions where we're, you know, we're, not, either, we're not comfortable that the technology is there, or we just don't want our, our systems used in that way. And so, you know, easy example is a lot of regulated industries, you know, you shouldn't use it for medical advice, you shouldn't use it for legal advice. But it's also, you know, beyond, one step beyond what's uh, legally required, there's also things like you don't, we don't want to use for a large scale political campaigning, right? There's a lot of concerns around that. And so we'll put, we have restrictions on that kind of thing. And we've asked customers not to do those, those types of things, you know, when, 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 they've, when they've talked to us. And so, so there's a lot of areas that, you know, we, you know, for example, the EU AI Act, you know, I have my concerns with it, but, you know, there are high risk areas Generally speaking, I think are, are good areas to be thinking about and also areas that we don't necessarily want to, you know, deploy, you know, uh, uh, AI in as well. So um, we're almost out of time and um, I want to ask you, as AI continues to evolve, um, what legal challenges do you predict and how OpenAI preparing for them? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's probably two. One, one is the overarching, just what is the world regulation going to look like and what, what, is, what is the patchwork regulation of countries looks like. I think that is a, again, not a great outcome for anybody and, and not a good outcome for anyone in this room especially. And then there's also the more industry specific applications, like what should AI look like in the medical sector, right? There's so much promise there and so much that can be done to improve uh, healthcare and, and you know, medical objectives. And 
that is honestly the number one question that we get from governments is how can we use this stuff to improve our healthcare costs? It's literally always the number one thing that comes up. And so how that's gonna be done is gonna be extremely challenging, right? AI or uh, uh, healthcare, deservedly so, is a very highly regulated industry. And, and having a thing that you know, analyzes past data to make predictions on it can, is gonna work really well in a lot of areas and it's gonna, not gonna work very well in many other areas. And that, finding that balance is going to be challenging. So it's so a big picture and then all the different you know, sector, sector specific ones are gonna be, are gonna be a lot of fun for everybody. How do you see the <clears throat> regulatory landscape changing in the next, let, let's say, six months? If I could predict, predict that, I would not be here right now. <laughs> but no, I would say you know, it, it's going to be, an accelerated version of what we're seeing now. I mean, you know, we are just at the start of the inflection curve, I think, you know, despite all the headlines you hear about it, like you guys in this room know like this is not a widely adopted, massively used technology yet, but it has so much potential to be used in all these different areas. And so as that adoption continues to increase, as more people you know, have real world encounters and uses of AI, there's gonna be more good stuff that comes out, a lot of good stuff that comes out, there's gonna be some bad stuff that comes out, and, and you know, all those things are the things that regulators and governments and ourselves and industry and academia and all that have to go think about and balance. And so I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. We're gonna see a lot more technological progression over the next several months. We're gonna see a lot more uh, regulatory focus and, and oversight. We're gonna see a lot more companies figuring out their AI direction, not, not their entire strategy yet, you know, but, but it's, they're, gonna get, they're gonna figure out where they wanna go with this, where they wanna build and what they wanna do. And so I think we're just gonna see continued growth around all, everywhere, right? The way, the way I talk about it internally is like we just have, AI is everything, and so that we have this unlimited surface area to cover, and similarly, you know, an AI conference, this next year's AI conference is probably gonna be you know, 10 times as big, because everyone is really hungry to learn about this stuff and, and you know, figure out how to do it right. Great, thank you so much. Great, um, great to have you here. All right, thank, thanks a lot. Thank you guys for your time, too. Thank you.